friends today i will be talking to you about writing skills and therein the principles for effective writing i'd like to begin the session by sharing with you a quotation from william lewis sapphire he was a very famous american journalist he was also the presidential speech writer for richard nixon and he has very wittingly shared an abrist in a quotation never say neverisms tips for writers it is a very witty collection of sentences that gives the gives out the basic principles that we must adhere to while writing i'll read out the quotation to you and move further in the presentation the quotation goes like this do not put statements in the negative form he says do not put statements in the negative form and uses not in it so he could have said put statements in a positive form so that in itself when i consider this and i write it in this form i see that the words have shortened when i am saying no or not my uh, even when somebody who cannot see me who has not met me but has read my words would probably envision me as a negative personality or a controlling personality because i have used do not wherein if whereas if i use put or statements or write statements in positive form that gives out a very positive a very pleasing impression to the reader i'll read out the next sentence that william says and don't start statement sentences with a conjunction and he has started a sentence with a conjunction that's and most of us when our train of thought is moving we forget that we should write in correct syntax and we begin our sentences with and and other uh, joiners like when while i'm speaking to you i am using and when while to connect my sentences to show a normal progression of thoughts however i cannot do that when i am writing because this is not correct grammar so this brings me to the point that there is a difference between spoken english and written english so we cannot write what we speak i'll move further to what william says he says if you reread your work you will find on rereading that a great deal of repetition can be avoided by rereading and editing there's so much of reiteration of rereading in this sentence and it has become a lengthy one when you see it on the slide because of the usage of this word and repetition of certain phrases you will find on rereading your work you should reread your work this phrase has been repeated it has become so lengthy and at times we found we find that it is superfluous because this has been referred to rereading our work has been referred to in the beginning and we understand as a reader that the rest of the sentence talks about this point only so this is what has been highlighted by him that how rereading and editing our work is so important for get, developing good writing skills for churning out a good written piece i'll move further to what he says now there's a long list i have just included a few witty ones there's a long list that is available online you can even read his writings and uh, otherwise also these principles or rules of grammar are available in many grammar books which i have included citations to references to in the written notes that are given out with this session so please refer to them to know these rules thoroughly he next says william says next never use a long word when a diminutive one will do so he's used a long difficult word diminutive instead of small so he says and now this has highlighted a very intrinsic basic and common problem of non native speakers non native speakers uh, learn english as an acquired language so uh, so they learn the correct and proper language but that does not uh, mean that that is how native speakers would use the language especially for indians knowing english is is a matter of pride and at times even a status symbol this can be referred to as the colonial hangover that is why we are hell bent upon using difficult words 
being very verbose, lengthy sentences, complex sentences going around in a rigmarole for a common reader or a listener to understand so as to project our proficiency and in some way a betterment or our elevating our, ourselves to a better standard or a position than the others around us. But believe you me, native speakers do not use language to impress others they use language for communication the simpler the language the better the communication that is what has been brought out in william's quote here the next thing that i'm going to read out and which is very important especially in writing is unqualified superlatives are the worst of all so in this sentence he says worst of all worst is a superlative adjective is the worst element of writing or a worst feature of writing or the worst mistake he has not specified and when i just use worst hanging in there just like that an adjective which does not precede a noun it the whole sentence becomes very informal i need to understand how i should use my adverbs and adjectives besides how should i use my nouns and pronouns because usually adverbs and adjectives are those words that come to decorate the sentence or that come to uh, qualify a noun modify a noun so they cannot be used without a noun in the sentence but as readers or writers even as speakers who are speaking quickly using a dif different language like english we forget to qualify our we forget to use nouns after adverbs or adjectives to specify that these are the words that are being qualified or modified by the adverbs and adjectives that we are using in our sentence so this is another point that has been brought out by william the next thing that points out is the accession euphemisms now this in itself is a very ambiguous phrase and that is a complete sentence and he has put a full stop after it euphemism is an indirect way of referring to something deaccession deaccession is a big word instead of it removing or avoiding could have been used easily so once we use such difficult words especially if such technical jargon is used which is so ambiguous unclear for a normal person to understand for a non scientific reader to understand the whole gist the whole purpose of writing the whole mm, essence of writing is lost because of such difficult words such ambiguous usage of vocabulary william further goes on to say that if in any word is improper at the end of a sentence a linking verb is so he is also commented about sentence construction and says that a linking verb like is is improper at the end of a sentence so we should never end our sentences with a linking verb and these faults in our writing usually creep up usually develop because of our spoken english spoken english is very much different from the written english we use contractions in spoken english but we do not use we prefer not to use contractions in written english especially if it is a formal document i'll further read out the last uh, uh, sentence the last quotation in these never say neverisms from uh, william that i've included and the last one he says is avoid trendy locutions that sound flaky so it says trendy locutions so although it might sound uh, very uh, in vogue it might sound very impressive but it ends it gives a very ambiguous unclear effect to my usage and it sounds flaky unrequired it is totally unnecessary so i should be very careful about my usage of words and vocabulary there's a long list and as as i said you can refer to them either online by searching his name and you can also refer to other uh sources of grammar and vocabulary to learn or to develop effective principles for writing this brings me to the first principle for effective writing and that is knowledge of grammar grammar is the tool through which we know how to use our language and there are certain topics in grammar that we can practice daily to improve our usage to be thorough in them the first topic that i'd like to take up with you in grammar is subject verb agreement 
Brennan Martin gives a very long list of how different types of singular or plural subjects agree with the verb or the verb agrees with the singular or plural subject. I'll take up examples here and show how there is a possibility of uh, confusion as to which verb, a singular verb or a plural verb will come and I'll tell you how this can be avoided. But these principles are available in depth elaborately explain there with a lot of practice material available in the books that I've included in my further reading section of the notes. The first sentence that I take up with you here is the chairman with the directors dash to be present for the meeting. Now in this sentence I ask you whether a singular verb or a plural verb should come. Now the word closest the noun closest to the verb which is specified by a dash here a blank here is a plural one the directors so most of us would say that a plural verb will come and have to be present for the meeting or are to be present for the meeting is the correct answer however when i read the sentence and see that the principal subject is the chairman Although there are two categories of people but they have been joined together not by using a normal conjunction like and but a preposition like with that is why the principal subject remains the subject and it is a singular subject the chairman that is why the verb that will come here will be a singular verb and not a plural verb. So I just cannot blindly close my eyes and say yes there is a rule that the verb agrees with the subject it is closest to. Although it is closest to the directors the plural subject here it cannot be a plural verb. Why? Because I have to check how the principal subject and the subordinate subject are joined together. If it had been the chairman and the directors then a plural verb would have come. Because as it is, there are two entities and the directors is also an equally important subject as the chairman. Alright, let's move further in this, the subject verb agreement topic. Now, I said that when we join two subjects together by using and, they become the same, of equal weightage and the subject totally becomes a plural subject. So there is a sentence here that addresses this confusion. So I cannot again blindly close my eyes and say yes there is an and coming in the subject portion of the sentence combining two nouns together. So this has to be a plural subject. Let me look at this example here for you. The rise and fall of the tide dash due to the lunar influence. Now there are there is the reference to the rise and the fall. Two things, two kind of activities of the tide. So would it take up a plural verb or would it take up a singular verb? It will take up a singular verb despite the fact that there is and in between the two activities to join them. It is because one idea is expressed by this kind of a subject. A tide that has risen has to fall. Bread and butter is his only meal. A similar sentence in this kind of a uh, example so he, that person is not surviving only on bread is not surviving only on butter but bread and butter together that is why they are together the rise and fall is together it expresses one idea that is why the verb agrees with the singular subject and I say is the rise and fall of the tide is due to the lunar influence there's a long list of such uh, uh, plural supposedly plural uh, subjects which take up a singular verb and all in Renan Martin and other gram and other grammar books it is a valuable exercise for us to practice this topic subject verb agreement to develop clarity about the verbs that we need to put I'll take another example with you and that is of collective noun we usually confuse and we say that collective noun represents a group or a a, um, a group or a uh, category and we can address that group as one single entity that is fine but there are instances wherein a collective noun will also take up a plural verb where is where are those instances let me take out take up the two sentences simultaneously with you and discuss how the verb usage is going to be different in these two examples the first sentence in this is the parliament dash divided on the report and the second sentence in this is the parliament passed the bill now for the first sentence the parliament dash divided on the report 
the parliament are divided on the report why have i called the parliament which is a singular entity are plural that's because i'm talking about division bifurcation within the unit that is why it has taken up plural verb whereas in the second instance in the second sentence or the last sentence in subject verb agreement or use of verbs i have said the parliament dash passed the bill the parliament has together collectively as one unity as one entity has done something that is why the collective noun becomes a singular subject and takes up a singular verb so i cannot again close my eyes and say yes it's a collective noun so it will take up a singular verb so this this kind of clarity about subject verb agreement rules of grammar can be developed by practicing grammar there's another tricky aspect of grammar that we use a lot and that is prepositions that i'm going to talk about next and there are a few examples that i'll discuss with you now prepositions there are more than 150 prepositions in english in english language and there are no particular rules for preposition it is through continuous usage through viewing or reading text in a context that we develop an understanding of which preposition has to be used do i say i read english in oxford or do i say i read english at oxford there is a difference when i say in oxford when i say at oxford when i say at oxford it means it refers to a smaller place and that means oxford university when i say in oxford it refers in refers to a bigger place so that means a city so any college any university in oxford city i am reading literature there now if you'll also look at this i said i read if i translate that from hindi which usually we indians or non native speakers usually tend to translate us uh, our english uh, our thoughts into english words by literal translation we think that it should not be reading it should be studying because that is how we know it but in english there are certain words that are used specifically especially for certain you like it for certain universities it is said that you only read at oxford you only read at cambridge you don't study there so study refers to something that we do on our own however there is uh, there is a faulty translation that we are like so many of us are um, so many of us are of uh, indians are blamed with and that is down with fever that phrase there is no such phrase in english it is just that we are running a high fever or so and so is running a high fever is suffering from a high fever is suffering from fever that is the correct usage in english however we indians tend to translate our thoughts from hindi to english or from our language to english and that is how a faulty translation or faulty usage comes about so i was talking about prepositions the knowledge of prepositions the correct usage of prepositions also develops over time when we read and we use them in context i'll take up the first example with you and specify how a prepositional phrase wherein a verb or an adverb that comes before a preposition changes its meaning when the same verb is followed by a different preposition and the meaning of that prepositional phrase changes and it changes and affects the meaning of the sentence totally let me take up the first example with you it says the mayor subscribed a handsome sum dash the flood relief fund so what should i put after subscribe to or for so there is a difference when i say subscribe to that means i endorse i agree i give something so in this instance the mayor has given some some, some amount of money some sums in the flood relief fund that is why subscribe to a hand subscribe the handsome sum to wherein it is correct to use subscribe for in other instances wherein i pay to purchase something like a membership i have subscribed for this magazine then in that instance i am on the receiving end and then i use for after subscribe the same way the verb celebrate 
if I say celebrated with, celebrated by, celebrated for, these three phrases have different meanings altogether. When I say celebrated with, it usually refers to nouns like uh, feelings, like fervor, zeal, enthusiasm. These are the things when, which are referred to when I say celebrated with, uh, with zeal and enthusiasm, celebrated by people of such and such community, celebrated by throwing colors on each other. So that is the scenario, that is the instance when I will say by after celebrate. When I say celebrated for or uh, has been celebrated for, that means that person is renowned for. Birbal was celebrated for his presence of mind. That means that person is renowned for, known for, popular for, for such and such thing, for a particular quality or whatever he or she is celebrated for. So that is how the meaning of the words changes, the meaning of sentences changes by using different prepositions after the same verb. Let me move further in this. There are certain typical usage of uh, prepositions that I want to highlight so that you be are more careful about these usage. He quarreled dash me dash a trifle. He quarreled dash me dash a trifle. He quarreled with me over a trifle. So it is always over a trifle. When trifle is coming, trifle is a small thing, non-issue then it is always over, not about a trifle, okay? The next sentence that I want to take up here is, he readily complied my request. Is it to or is it with? It is, he readily complied to my request, not complied with. It is compliant with and complied to. We tend to confuse because the verbs are similar, their forms are different. The words are similar, their forms are different. That is why we get confused as to which preposition will come. There's another one that I want to take up here. And this will also specify how prepositions can make a difference in uh, the sentence to the extent of making the language formal or informal. Like I said, written English is different from spoken English. The same way, formal and informal language, in formal and informal language, English is different. They are different things. So let's look at this last example in prepositions. It says, we should rely dash our efforts. Should it be upon here or should it be on here? Some people, especially from the new generation, would say that upon is a long word. It is almost archaic in its uh, connotations, in its meaning, bearings. So I would avoid it and I would say rely on. Whereas correct usage is upon because rely comes not only for the present instance. For example, depend on. Depend on is correct. When I say rely or reliance, it is developed through a certain practice over a period of time, through a certain experience with a person or a device or a method of doing or a manner of doing an activity that a reliance is developed. So it not only refers to the present instance, but also the experience that we've had in the past and our expectation for the experience in future. So rely upon is the correct usage, although it might seem old, archaic, but it also makes the language formal. If I use rely on, it makes the language informal. It may be the accepted norm in today's usage, but then it gives a very informal tone to my writing. Let me take up the last topic that I'm going to take up today in grammar. There are many topics that we need to pay attention to. But the last thing that I felt, and I've referred to it in my previous session on writing skills, and that is punctuation. How a single stroke, full stop, changes the meaning especially in punctuation apostrophe people you know uh, most of us like if we put it's with an apostrophe i t apostrophe s it does not show belongingness or the genitive form of the pronoun it or the possessive form of the pronoun it it shows the contraction it is but we tend to get confused and these days when we are using the written word, using English language so casually, so frequently while sending text messages, um, messages on social networking sites, social networking applications, we tend to overlook 
our syntax and grammar and the spellings have also gone down the drain because there is spell checker software available more so the word ms word even points out with a blue underline when a word has been placed incorrectly grammatically so to such a level our writing is being associated checked edited by machines that we have become dependent on them and if we have to put pen to paper without any spell checker without any software available without any grammar checker available then we most in most of the instances we forget our spellings we write incorrectly we use wrong rules so now i am going to talk about punctuation and how correct knowledge of grammar and punctuation is important this is one sentence which i am going to use read out to you without any punctuation mark it's just a collection of words it's a sentence which may or may not have meaning for you and i read it thus a woman without her man is nothing a woman without her man is nothing whereas when i include a pause in this sentence and i express that pause with a comma you will be able to make out that pause with my expression in speech with my verbal expression as to where have i put the comma you will notice that the meaning has changed let me read out the first instance where i've placed a comma a woman without her man is nothing a woman without a woman without her man is nothing let me read out the next instance where i have just moved the comma by one word and i changed the pause and the meaning also changes a woman without her man is nothing a woman without her man is nothing so when i read out the sentence in the first instance with the comma it spec it highlighted the meaning conveyed was a woman without her man that for a woman's identity entity man is very important the presence of man is very important whereas in the next example a woman without her man is nothing that for the entity of a man the presence of a woman is very important so the so the sentence the meaning has changed diagrammatically oppositely it has changed entirely the tables have turned just because of one comma that i have shifted from one word before it or one word after it so that is how important grammar is the next thing that i can talk about for understanding or developing good writing skill is a rich vocabulary a rich vocabulary is not developed by reading the dictionary the dictionary is only a reference book it has to be referred to while we are reading and we come across a word which is difficult to understand yes so i should read as much as possible and when i'm reading in context i should pick up words that are difficult for me to understand i also try to teach my students these are school level students example that i'm going to take up with you as to how to develop a richer vocabulary or to enhance their learning of semantics of words by just one word for example a student of class 4th came across a word diversification so i asked her to tone it down to trim it down to the smallest possible word that she think she has heard somewhere she has read somewhere she is familiar with and she said diversification i can trim down to diverse so we wrote down that diverse as the root word yes then i asked others around her in the class can you think of other words which are similar sounding or maybe similar with diverse so they came up with diversion they came up with diversity so this is how we develop our vocabulary in the base at the root of our word tree we can have the root word and from it various shoots of various forms and modifications of the word that we have kept at the base so i came up with diversity diversion diversification and then i looked up the dictionary what is the part of the speech whether it is a noun whether diversity is a noun whether diversion is a noun whether diversification is a noun adjective pronoun whatever and wrote it down and then the exact meaning of these words however when the student was able to trim down the word to diverse she understood 
that diversification has to do something with diverse it is somewhat similar in meaning to diverse which means different so 80% of the meaning of the word can be understood by us when it is read in context furthermore can be understood by us when we know the root word and our vocabulary can also grow by making such word trees this brings me to my next point another effective principle for developing writing skills and that is reading reading the newspaper is good enough it is good to develop general awareness and knowledge but it is also a good idea to read about our area of work and study to read the work which is written not only in the formal manner which is written not only as an instructional material like notes and textbook but also read in about our work about about our area of study uh, which uh, works which are written in an informal manner in a casual manner like blog posts like magazine articles we should read these things as well to know as to how our technical subjects are being referred to in the common language in lingua franca instead of the technical jargon because we need to use those we might need to use simpler words language vocabulary for writing instruction manuals for common lay for a layman for a common reader also i have felt that if i need to increase my or improve my proficiency of writing in a language that is not my first language i should be able i should read or expose myself to that language in as much as free time as possible with me so that means my pleasure time reading should also be in english if i want to learn english language so i should not only be reading about my subject area of study field of work but i should also be reading novels i should also be reading magazines on topics that interest me like magazines on food and culinary skills travel magazines or magazines on fashion or general lifestyle magazines because as much as i expose myself to a language in free time the more i will pick it up that is how i learned my mother tongue not because i was taught in hindi medium schools that i picked up hindi but because i interacted it in an informal atmosphere in that language i used it making mistakes and being corrected repeatedly that i learned that language that is why it is important to expose ourselves to a language that we are trying to learn to write and for the same reason i recommend that we should write if we should watch english movies and english serials so for every two hindi movies that we watch and i want to learn english language i'll go and watch one english movie i may read the subtitles initially and gradually i will move my vision to the characters who are speaking without looking at the subtitles and understanding and this will help me to develop my proficiency in the language the next point or the next principle that helps me to develop effective writing skills is regular practice i should not shy away from any opportunity available to me to write and i and these days these opportunities are abundant i believe we give ourselves these opportunities every day by writing messages on whatsapp on text on any text message on updating our face uh, our facebook status and everywhere so instead of using a language mostly what i see is students are using english script to write hindi words we are polluting both the languages we are polluting hindi as well as english we do not know correct spellings or grammar either for hindi or for english i suggest i recommend this that we use the script of the language to write that language and to write that language correctly formally applying all the principles and rules of grammar syntax spellings everything and also we should also not shy away from responsibilities uh, if we have to draft a circular draft a notice we should not try to pass it on to a willing colleague we should take it up initially we might make mistakes but that is all right we will be corrected but that is how we will learn if we are not given these opportunities especially in an official setup or these office opportunities don't come by we should start by writing our journal our diaries now writing a journal or a diary is also a very cathartic or a very relieving stress relieving exercise and if i make it a point to write only 3 or 5 or 10 sentences a day in my diary but in correct 
manner in correct using correct grammar vocabulary rules and everything else and in a way using a difficult word at a time to know how to use it properly i will be improving my writing skills so i should write as much as possible i should have regular practice of my writing of various types of writings drafting an email a formal email and informal email and everything the last thing that we can do for effective writing which is a must principle for effective writing is getting our work reviewed or a feedback of our work because and this feedback should come from three sources it should come from a person who is more proficient than us in the subject that we have written about and also in language in which we have written the medium that we have used to write the, about that topic we should also get a review from our peers or colleagues who have the same level of proficiency in the language and the subject and we should also get a feedback from people com from common readers who are not so well versed with the details or the ideas of the subject or with the language to know whether what we have written is understood by all types of people all the strata of readers that might come to read that our writing might um, get access to and when that feedback is available to us when that review is available to us we must incorporate the changes we must practice to remove our shortcomings only then our writing skills will improve and it is very important to take the criticism to review or to take the review in the right spirit it is there for your improvement for my improvement i do not need to feel offended by it i shall now move further by discussing with you certain helpful tips that will come in handy while writing any piece of document like a letter a covering letter an email minutes of a meeting a paragraph a project report a technical report a research paper whatever so the these list of helpful tips i'll quickly read out and discuss with you and uh, end the session the first tip that i have to share with you is called gaps g a p s now this is an acronym which stands for genre audience purpose style genre means whether i am going to write in a formal way or an informal way if i have to write an email to communicate with my team i can use informal words i can use colloquial phrases for example colloquial phrases can be chai time now chai is a word that is now accepted by oxford dictionary otherwise it's an indian hindi word bazaar is a word which came from hindi and urdu the middle east and the indian subcontinent but it is accepted as an english word now so i can use colloquial phrases in my informal interaction if there is an inside joke for you know communication uh, for example in my home if my one of my children is uh, throwing a tantrum and has uh, removed himself or herself from our group or our family and is sulking in a corner we call uh, we refer to that person as rk that stands for rani ke kai so if you have these kind of colloquials or inside jokes or pet phrases you can include those that genre can change the informal genre can come if you are talking with a close group of your people however if you are writing that email to your boss if you are writing that email to everybody of the same level of the same uh, of being your peers and colleagues but not your team within your organization you cannot use such phrases you cannot be colloquial in your usage you cannot be informal so you have to take up a formal genre of writing yes then you have to think about audience what is the proficiency am i addressing few people whose uh, first language is not english will i be addressing people who will not be able to understand english at all so i need to get this translated by someone and i have already fixed the translator so just to make the translator's job easy i should not use difficult words like we talked about diminutive in williams quotation that instead of using small he used diminutive where a smaller word can be used so i should use a smaller word so that is how my audience influences my writing what is my purpose of writing is it giving out information is it is it influencing them is it a negotiation document is it inviting 
or uh, insti or encouraging my uh, funders my sponsors to release funds for my project or my work what is the purpose of my writing that will also change my expression will i be humble will i be pleased if if i am writing uh, this kind of a document what is the purpose if i am writing to my subordinates can i request them rather than ordering them no i cannot do that so that is how the purpose of writing influences the writing and finally is the structure how should i go about it what should i include in it how should i change it how sh should i what should i give first usually when we are writing an email uh, a formal email i suggest that we in the first paragraph write what is the purpose of this email even if it is in a continuing thread of communication what is the purpose of this email and then in the second paragraph i quickly enlist as bullet points which i will not do in while i am writing the purpose of this email because i am writing one email to the same person within the same organization only once for one topic i am not going to include two or three subjects in an email communication so my purpose or the first paragraph the structure cannot have bullet points but what action is required because of the email or as a consequence of the email can be put down in bullet points so that it is easier to understand easier to remember and easier to and looks like easy work to execute so that is how my structure my influences my writing then i'll go on to formal informal and ornate style of writing i differentiated between what is formal and informal writing if i am communicating with the for organization head or another organization i'm very formal if i'm communicating with friends peers or a close group i can be informal if i am writing to express my or project my knowledge of language i can be ornate if i want to be confusing if i want to be a little ambiguous i can use ornate ornate or decorative form of writing which can be similar to the quotations that i referred to which has lots of big words heavy phrases rigmarole style of writing the another thing that i need to know is i should strike a common chord or hit the common ground with my reader why should my reader read what i'm writing because i in my writing through my writing even if it is an email if even it is a project report or a research paper i'm offering something that he or she will be interested in reading or knowing so this should i should be able to focus or pin down before i begin my writing i should have a gender neutral language like uh, we have been used to using man is a social being no we sh that is excluding women in today's day and age that becomes very gender centric so we can say humans are social beings so that is how we should know how to change our language and make it gender neutral so as to avoid any unpleasant situations or prejudiced um, um, abuse about us about our thoughts about our personality whenever we are writing something we should prepare a rough draft first it can come as complete sentences or just points that we are going to use in the uh, actual piece of writing and the structure of the points should be according to the structure that we have in mind or that we should adhere to we should always use correct grammar and syntax even when we are writing informally so when i said that we are they exchanging messages please don't write your as you are we don't know what your you what what does it mean you are together or you just the letter u space letter r does it mean you are or does it mean your y o u r or does it mean you apostrophe r e you are we do not know that and we forget these spellings because when we write formally with on with pen with paper sometimes i'm telling you we will get confused you your or you are with an apostrophe even the spell checker even the grammar software will put a blue line but you may not know the correct spelling sometimes t h e i r is overlooked by the software where where t h e r e should have come so we cannot always depend on the machines to supply us with the correct word usage and grammar rules so please practice informally also correct rules active voice is always better than passive voice because we are associating directly between the doer of the verb and the verb or the action that is happening and the sentences are shorter rather than passive voice the cat jumped on the mouse the mouse was jumped upon by the cat i cut an apple with a knife 
the apple was cut with a knife by me. The sentence is longer, the meaning is difficult and these are simple sentences with normal words. If I put in technical words in this, it will be so difficult for a common reader to understand. I should control my use of adjectives and adverbs because that makes the document very verbose and it also loses its credibility. Why do I need to accentuate or highlight the importance of something by including repeatedly adjectives or adverbs in it? I should avoid it because that leads to suspicion in the mind of the reader. I should pay special attention to the use of apostrophe like I stressed its and its. As to where apostrophe should come there, it should not come because it changes the meaning. And these rules will be available to you in any good grammar book. And I've included the list of grammar books in the notes that will be given out to you as hard copy with this session. We should avoid usage of colloquial terms in formal communication. Yes, totally is a word that Indians use. It is not used in formal communication. I am totally convinced by your argument. It is incorrect. It is too, It is a colloquial usage. I am completely convinced, wholly convinced. I am thoroughly convinced is the best usage here. But I told you we should in, avoid the usage of adverbs and adjectives because they lend an air of suspicion to our written words. We should avoid cliches. For example, um, take the bull by the horns. Now, this means to broach the topic or to, um, uh, to be unafraid to broach a difficult topic. But then um, it is also ambiguous. It can mean so many things. I, when you refer to take the bull by the horn, in, we'll take the bull by the horn in the meeting. Are you referring to the difficult topic that is going to be um, discussed? Are you referring to a topic that is uh, that has a lot of dissension and disagreement over? Or are you referring to the boss who is going to be present in the meeting? No, you should not use these kind of cliches which can lead to different interpretations. Careful use of words which are often confused like there there it's it's yours yours these words which are homophones should be correctly used the spellings should be correctly used in writing we should write as often as possible because that only will improve our writing it's a skill it has to be practiced nobody is born with it even writers become better after writing two or three novels producing more books reading once writing aloud helps us to know what we have written, how it reads out, how a common man reads it. And to focus specifically on mistakes of grammar and syntax and not focusing on the content, we should begin by reading, rereading our work from the bottom, from the end. So what happens is if I'm reading from the end one sentence at a time, I'm not focusing whether the content makes sense or not, whether I've stuck to the theme, but I'm correcting the grammar mistakes, the mistakes of usage of vocabulary and syntax in my written piece. That is why I'm reading from the end. We should also read work related to our writing, which is both formal and informal in nature to know how technical experts and uh, thinkers in our field talk about it, how I need to present formally my work and also how in informal terms common man is talking when I need to face an interviewer, when I need to give out a communique that goes in the newspaper, what are the words that I need to write so that a newspaper reader can understand, so that a TV viewer, news watcher can understand what I'm speaking. That is why I should read all types of work related to my all, uh, field of study or area of work. I should also get feedback from three types of people and incorporate it. And I have developed upon what dealt upon what are these three types of people, three stratas of people who should be I, I be seeking feedback from. And these are my seniors, better people, experts, my peers and colleagues, and people who do not know as much as I know, either the subject or the language. I like to wind up the session with a quotation from Noble Platt and it is very pertinent to what we have discussed today. I'll read out to you and then I will quickly elaborate upon it before ending the session. Norbert says, the act of putting pen to paper encourages pause for thought. This in turn makes us think more deeply about life which helps us regain our equilibrium. 
so whenever i'm involved in something which is which involves in depth work analysis research i should write it down a daily entry in the log book or in the journal helps me to collect my thoughts help me to take a pause take a step back from whatever i have done or achieved and analyze it further and plan better for my future action not only in writing my future communication but also my future action whatever my writing is about even that gets affected and influenced when i write about it and write um, by taking pauses by elaborating upon whatever i have worked on in the past i hope all of you would have benefited from today's session and would have uh, picked up effective principles for writing and improving writing skills i thank you all